especially interesting in general. So, so you know, um, this process actually um, um, is exactly what we call it. Um, um, according to Holland Barth, said the jouissance of reading things in in his um, book on the pleasure of the text. He talks about you know there's a kind of readable text, there's a kind of writable text, and and the readable text is about you know being passively consumed kind of uh, writing, and you can have a little bit pleasure out of that, but you will never get into kind of um, jouissance, namely uh, how called this, uh, how to say in English jouissance. Okay. Uh, ecstasy, right? So to get ecstasy, you have to really have a kind of sexual relationship with the work. So that means basically it's about actively participating in challenging things that are not possible to be understood. So, so that pleasure, that kind of you know process, how we can translate it into so-called expression formats. It's a constant kind of um, uh, challenge. And this is, I think, why we need curators sometimes to make the game even more messy. That the game has to go on, and because everyone has to justify uh, his way of spending the so-called public money in different ways. So in the gallery, we have hundreds of employees who are dealing with you know, emails and, and translation and setting up mics, projectors, and so on. And also, we have some people who kind of uh, dominate the brain of this place, which are curators. And, and then you have other curators, like independent curators, um, who are starting with other kind of expectation. And at the end of the day, we, we pretend that we are serving the artist to achieve some kind of perfect exchange, which is not possible. So that's the game. I, I just want to you know, start with maybe um, such a short comment on that. Thank you. Hmm. But I think that, uh, thank you for your points. I think that uh, especially when there's like more and more frameworks, such as the realm of, of uh, you know, exchange between regions or, uh, you know, uh, um, rather high diplomatic states of sort of like represent national representation or, uh, you know, something that fits into the politics of a city or of, or of a context. Not only the artists, but even the curators start to fade away uh, below the sort of uh, institutional expectations and political expectations of the, of the narrative that sort of like needs to be communicated. So I think uh, because of that, I'd like to come back to the question of money. And, um, of course, there were a few examples mentioned, but I think it would be good to go even deeper and to, uh, you know, have even more examples on the table. And I would, uh, probably the best way to do it is to, for if uh, each of us can uh, mention some of the, perhaps, like, defining international projects in which we were involved, and to mention who paid for it and why. <laughs> uh, like, was it, uh, you know, was it... Uh, you know, the, the breakthrough moment or, 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 or something else in your career paid by your own government because uh, they wanted to promote the, the, the culture of your country abroad? Was it uh, another government somewhere else that again wanted you for your nationality? Was it, you know, a completely um, um, lucky and, 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 and unproblematic situation where you actually found an institution that was independent and appreciated the intellectual proposition that you put forward there. Uh, so it would be, would be good to actually um, go through these examples. Who would like to start? Uh, I have uh, several failures from my <laughs> experience. <laughs> because uh, I initiated many projects by myself, so it didn't fit for the system at all. So the new, new proposition always uh, failed in a way. So um, I, I started a curatory office uh, from 2005, and it's a self-sustained uh, kind of office. So always uh, make a project. Uh, difficulties. Uh, I had a five-year project called uh, Platform, and that's also didn't have any government funding at all. So I, I did the fundraising and also other jobs to have the 
the, the project works. And so it's, it's really difficult to, without the space or uh, funding sources, to have the project. But also, in a way, it's more freedom. Because uh, this year, I work for Gwangju Biennale. And then there are so many paperwork to get the money for the this Biennale. <laughs> so <laughs> there is uh, like a two different kind of side and two different kind of working mode to work for this uh, existing funding or going to nothing to do project. So I, I think I've been to the uh, platform two, three times, actually, I think, because uh, there isn't biennial in Seoul, right? There is a media city, so yeah, it's media a is more like city yeah. and branding. But yeah. uh, it's interesting. I, I really like to know more about the financial model of the uh, platform, because it's probably the most interesting international <laughs> program, <laughs> like self-organized by a tutorial office, and within like all the extensive uh, networking of yeah. uh, curators and artists. You also work with like uh, Howard Gallery and all the other. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, it's a five-year project, and um, yeah, and and each year different kind of models. I I want to study so different models. And the Maya told about the project is 2009. And I used a uh, uh, former National Security Defense Center called Kimusa. It, it was, it, now it, it is uh, going to open next year for the new National Museum of Contemporary Art. And then I got the space for free because uh, uh, the museum uh, is under developed to design the, to open the new uh, National Museum of Contemporary Art. So. I got a free space, and then uh, it's, it's like a collaboration with uh, institutions and artists to help me to do realize the project. So uh, I ask an institution to, to uh, recommend some artists to, uh, to be in the show. And also I ask, uh, because uh, the National Security Defense Center is kind of close place, and it's been for many years uh, not open to the public, so uh, I want to open up as a creatory approach. So it's one did you work with? Was it the a branch of the military? Was it the cultural uh, offices? Or who was administering it? So how was that? Uh, it was, uh, when I started work, I asked to get, give a free space. It was on the Ministry of Culture. It was a uh, during the process of uh, giving the military to giving the space to buying from the Ministry of Culture that property. So it's been empty, so I used that uh, time. And, and my approach for the curator, create, creating is uh, using kind of abandoned spaces or the, the place which is going to change. So I want to use before changing. So this year I started a new project at uh, border of South and North Korea uh, at the MZ area. So I'm hoping to do project every year until unification. That's what we call a long term commitment. Maybe soon. Uh, yeah, so, <laughs> so, yeah, and so. The funding is uh, very, very little. So everybody, uh, uh, it's like a potluck party. So everybody brings something to into the space and, and do the project. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's all. Uh, anyone else for full disclosure? <laughs> uh, in India, we have no hardly any funding for the arts from the government. So it's, uh, I think, all. So the, the projects that I have worked on so far, it's mainly been funded by the host organization, and they have done the fundraising. I, I live in Bangalore, and which is actually on the periphery of all these art fairs and auctions which are taking place. So we have, because of the lack of government institutions and things like that, we have a number of uh, collectives which are initiated by artists or groups of people. And funding is difficult, but I, I myself had something called Collab, which is a collaborative for art and architecture. And uh, we had a space that was actually given to us by an architect, so we didn't have to pay a rent for it. And we worked with a lot of these other organizations like uh, the British Council and 
the Goethe Institute to make international kind of uh, projects happen. But uh, there is a lot of this reciprocal collaboration which goes on in Bangalore because of the lack of uh, government infrastructure. Um, what to say? <laughs> um, I guess, you know, we, we are living in a really strange moment that, uh, you know, um, there's a, again, uh, um, funding actually has to do with um, a, a, a very uh, uh, interesting process of the bankruptcy of the idea of the politics, the idea of a public politics. So um, we, we are actually living through a time that all the governments are becoming increasingly a kind of managers of management of um, certain type of economic models, uh, which is um, so-called globalized uh, capitalism, right? Um, so, um, so then the, ori the ori original idea of having a, a government uh, as some organized as a kind of uh, institution to serve the society is very quickly being kind of collapsed into um, basically um, a kind of gatekeeper of maintaining um, a, another collapsing economic uh, system. So, um, so we are actually in the in the periods that um, um, public uh, the the topic of funding becomes increasingly um, um, uh, related to uh, the immediacy of the market, uh, whether it's you know so. Whether the government basically um, um, does, uh, the government wants to uh, justify its actions. Um, the main consideration is about how to get the, uh, more funding for itself to maintain the power through the next election, and that's typically what's happening in America. I think it's in many, many other places. So the the crisis of the democracy in general, it's actually affecting. Um, how the funding structure of culture um, um, it's so um, so um, there's a kind of American model um, in which there's no public funding basically for the culture so everything comes from uh, traditionally from patrons uh, um, sponsors and so on um, no the, the traditional patrons the philanthropia kind of uh, uh, people. Uh, but now it's becoming sponsors. The sponsors is what? Sponsors is basically an extension of the market. Um, sponsor basically needs return, right? So, so in that, um, it used to be, a, you know, the traditional format of patronage is kind of celebrating some remarkable individuals in the society um, to do good things for the other people, right? But now, uh, when you look at the, the logic of the sponsors, basically it's about branding, the extension of the branding of something in the market. So we, we just have a samples, we have the energy, that's great, and so on. So, um, so we, we are actually seeing a very interesting Again, I don't want to go to concrete examples, but really, um, um, it's it's been for a while kind of obsessive I, uh, reflection for me to understand what we are doing actually in terms of uh, what kind of institution and what what's the, the mission of the institution actually is and what's the mission of an exhibition. So I don't know. Um, so I'm maybe a bit more pessimistic in in terms of. Um, but because of that, because of the, the collapsing process, that maybe it will provoke some very interesting reactions. Mm -hmm. And those reactions can be highly creative and meaningful. And, and it's so irrelevant to the market that it becomes really socially relevant. So I'm hoping that. But if you look at your own career and the projects that you developed in the last 20 years, do you, can you see like a major shift in, in the sources of um, Yeah, maybe. I, I'm just thinking one example, which is um, 
again, it, it's um, a failure for the sponsors, and it's a success for the artist. It's um, it's um, the Chinese Pavilion in Venice by Annual, um, 2007. Um, I was totally surprised that the, the Chinese Culture Ministry asked me to do to be the curator. Um, number one, I'm no longer Chinese citizen. I need a visa to go to China. Uh, number two, um, I guess um, they were hoping uh, by inviting someone like me to curate that, um, uh, they would uh, gain certain kind of recognition and also some direct um, economic interest. So, um, so it's really interesting. And, and then actually we spent the money and then I did the project with four women artists. Um, only um, the, the, the idea is really to say as a model of development in China as also as a model of um, expansion of biennales and art market and so on um, there is a, a, a very uh, strong tendency I might call it the macho thing um, <laughs> the model of development urbanization um, and um, new technology, and so on and so forth, are uh, actually uh, reflecting, a, a, again, um, a kind of a male impulse of gaining power, and so on and so forth, um, and possession. So, so I decided to, you know, represent China with four weak, very fragile, nice-looking women. <laughs> and they did wonderful works that are not telling anything about China, <laughs> but they're telling about what they are different in the context of China and also in the context of Venice. So, of course, they, they hope um, this project would bring money um, to, to the uh, organization. Um, and because of the, the complication of the project and also the inactive kind of reaction to the idea of looking for funding, so we didn't get more funding than the original funding we had. So I, I was very happy about that, and they become really unhappy. So they even didn't show up at the opening. <laughs> so um, so that's great, and then the artists have the total freedom to do what they want. <laughs> so I guess, you know, as a curator, some, somehow you have to think about um, on Ten years ago, uh, more than ten years ago, when I was helping to uh, to organize the first um, international biennial, the Shanghai Biennial in in China, and the idea was really to to convince the public opinion and also somehow the government to accept contemporary art as something normal, good for the society, and so on, and so the artists can the normal have a better condition, um, and after that one has to really think about when it became a kind of official dom of art, then you have to really uh, take a distance and to become an opposition again and to go inside the organ and do something from the same to deconstruct it. So I, I guess, you know, um, the, the job of a curate, curator somehow, um, it should be kind of based on such a political stance, I guess. So, uh, following by that, uh, is that right? Um, afterwards, the uh, Chinese government learned that it's a very old model, so... <laughs> and then, uh, and then the next year, the, the yeah. next year became uh, very funny. I was told that um, the next curator was a, um, an artist. Um, and basically, he helps uh, raise money to to have the pavilion done. So I don't know. Um, and the lady said but, she but the, the 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 pavilion. I mean, the expression was. I, I don't know. I shouldn't make any comments on that. But <laughs> uh, was pretty um, insignificant. I think it's about time um, to uh, open it to the public. Would any, would any of you would like to, to mention anything else uh, before? Or I think then we're ready to take questions from the audience. Can, can, can we have 
turn my light on the audience as well. Hello. Thinking of the topic two decades of exchange, historically, I think that cultural exchange in Australia has been framed as being from nation to nation. I would be interested to know if you and the panellists feel that there's a move away from nation to nation cultural exchange and more exchange expressed as city to city or regionally to regionally. Who, who is this question for? Just to know. For anyone who's spoken today. Actually, uh, last year was a Korean and Australian year and, and um, I collaborated with Gertrude uh, uh, for the show called City Within the City. Uh, it was a show to exchange uh, for the uh, uh, two countries, uh, how can I say, uh, exchange year. But we, we uh, Alexi and me in, uh, decide not to have uh, just an Australian and Korean artist show. So we made a show about uh, one thing to collaborate together uh, to make the shows. Yeah, so it, it's a little bit different kind of. Uh, uh, we have uh, some funding support for this exchange year, but we uh, made the show differently. And may I follow up by asking, did you feel under pressure to frame your curatorial ideas around nation-to-nation exchange? How was your problemization of that Korea-Australian framework yeah. so received? Yeah, I, I don't like to make a national exhibition, so... So instead of that, uh, we invited uh, Lebanese artists and also uh, Chinese, uh, Australian, Australian artists and, and, and also artists from Mexico. So uh, we work together as an institution, but not having the national exhibition. Yes. With the theme, yes. I think I just want to add here, and also like, well, with the risk of being repetitive and sort of bringing the money in the question all the time, but... Uh, at the end of the day, all such exchanges have, uh, there's like a, you know, diplomatic and ultimately financial reason behind. So I think uh, we have to trace not only the money, but also the, the way in which like the funding agencies are structured either at national level or at regional level or at city level to understand like if there are indeed phenomena of, of this nature and if there is a shift towards you know relations between cities and cities. I mean I would say that you know in, in countries where you know economies are centered around where, where the national government is more has a stronger role in promoting you know the, the general business interests of that country then you would have ultimately cultural policies that are nationally driven. And where you have like more autonomy at city level and or, or at provincial level or at uh, whatsoever federal subject level, uh, then you would have those kind of exchanges. So I guess at the end it's still a question of like following the money and following um, you know geographies of economic exchange. Um, uh, this is a question I, I guess for anyone on the panel. In Asia, the Goethe Institute is often cited and seem to be quite successful in the way it goes about cultural exchange. I'm interested in why you think, from your perspective, the Goethe is successful, or is or are there issues with the way the way that model works? Actually, I have worked quite extensively with the Goethe Institute in um, in Bangalore. And I think one of the reasons I continue to work with them is because they're generous and there aren't strings attached. Because I have a program and I tell them this is this is the program, there has to be a German component to it. But then that, you know, besides that, they're willing to support the program. So I think that's one of the reasons I, I continue to work with them. And, they, and they're very uh, progressive as well, you know. They, they're, they're willing to look at your project and think about it. And 
Yeah, I, I think, you know, this phenomena of um, Pratt Institute or British Council, um, um, the French Institute and so on, um, was the past. Basically, it was 10 years ago, it was really successful when um, most of the Asian countries didn't have um, organizations, museums, galleries for contemporary art. And now, basically, they become, from my knowledge, they become increasingly um, um, less important in in the cityscapes or cultural scape of, uh, of uh, those countries. And what is interesting is actually very quickly they become basically travel agents for German or French or English artists to come to Asia. Um, so, um, I don't know. Um, I think they, they have to face uh, a kind of reinvention of themselves. So I, I think the British um, uh, um, more cynical and more smart <laughs> in the sense that they decided to cut all the budgets in uh, British councils in Europe and put it in Middle East because they, they don't see there's certain kind of um, uh, political role that they want to stabilize the region by civilized um, the suspicious Islamic uh, population. So that's the political change. Um, so they might play an increasingly important role, or they try uh, to, mon to put money there. Um, so you can see you know, this success, it's, there's a very clear political agenda behind it, you like it or not. So, um, so somehow, you know, um, we have to be also somehow cynical enough to accept their travel uh, money to help the artists to come to Asia. That's great. But, um, but somehow I, I really think we are in a totally new situation that also I think for the APT itself, it's also a very interesting challenge. It's now um, Asia are having um, more and more institutions, maybe the biggest museums um, are being built in Hong Kong, in Abu Dhabi and so on. Um, and those museums, um, I don't know that they, when they open, how much they are still relevant. Uh, I, I still don't know, but you know, uh, it, it's a tendency. It's an interesting kind of new situation. Yeah, but you know, it is. They aren't. They aren't as important as they used to be. But they're not redundant either, because in India you don't have too many other funding agencies, and now we have a private one called India Foundation for the Arts, and of course there's Asia Link and these other new agencies which have come in, but then you still rely on people like this. You know that there is an agenda. But then if it's an artist you want to work with from Germany, that serves your purpose yeah. in a way. Yeah. So, so this is why I said we should be cynical sometimes. Yeah. Or realistic. Also the funding structure is different from like India and China is yeah, uh, uh, I mean <laughs> they are Lots of support mm -hmm. for India and China but mm -hmm. in Korea there is not much support from mm -hmm. these institutions. No. <laughs> so, and they have a focus country, and then Korea is not a, I think Taiwan is also not a focus country for funding. And I mean, this institution has a focus country, and they had more money. Because I know that the Gate Institute yes. at some point actually had like a major India focus, and they were yes, like, yeah. they were actually like sending German yeah. uh, uh, curators and, and architects there. But I guess, well, I mean, I, of course, it's a diff I mean, this, this question of relevance is differs from country to country. I mean, I, I also in Hong Kong, like even like six or seven years ago, the Goethe Institute was very important, and now it's not even. It is basically need a, a, a travel agent, you know, for for the mm -hmm. German-based artists. So, um, you know, indeed, with the development of a context and development of like institutions that are more locally grown, uh, uh, this kind of like international funding structures. Diminishing role. I mean, I think well, if we talk about Goethe, there's of course a difference in between these institutions because the uh, French Institute is more of a, you know, like clear agenda for French nationalism and, and you know, uh, 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 some glory of, uh, of a faded empire. And the British Council is also more of a shameless uh, promoter of, of, of British economic interests and it's very actually honest about it and I would say that the Goethe Institute is much more of a you know product of the German industry of guilt and it has a more humanistic 
agenda that is maybe less immediately pragmatically pragmatic uh, uh, minded, but yeah. Actually, actually, I'm, uh, I'm working on the uh, publication sponsored by Gusa Institute. <laughs> the whole project is called um, yeah, to the <laughs> No, no, no. And actually, it's a project that uh, from the internal of Europe to discuss the like, Europe as the uh, EU as a political economic unity. There is like lots of contradictions and lots of like uh, varieties, like culturally, socially, politically. So, uh, how, d uh, d where is the methodology to discuss it as like w Europe as an image to present it uh, to the, the rest of the world? And then they have to look at it from the outside of Europe, like uh, of course from China, because uh, there is an interesting. Um, like um, let's say phobia mm -hmm. uh, uprising in Europe. So if you see the uh, so sort of the inter um, the distance between these two different uh, from outside of Europe to see why in short just how to look at each other something like that. I mean it's funny that whenever there is a, a region uh, um, with like crisis of uh, economic or political crisis, there's always right away, let's talk about this. <laughs> let's talk about what is Europe. Let's talk about what is we. Yeah, well, uh, very often culture is the big reconciler or it's supposed it's to be the one Define conflicts. Are there more questions? I think we have. Uh, do we have time for more questions? I think so. Yes. Are there more questions? There for the um, I was interested with your critique of perennials in your first presentation, and you've written a lot about them, and um, but you've done a lot, of course, in many different places. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just interested, from your perspective, like how you approach. Do you have a similar approach when you work in different places, or do you approach each one quite differently? Well, um, the things are like that. Um, I guess I, I I work a lot with intuition, um, meaning that. Um, I go someplace and smell it and taste it. Um, and then um, usually for every project I would do six months or nine months research on um, try to understand the history, the place, meet people, especially meeting people. Sometimes you, you might you know read the chronology of the country by heart, but you don't understand that place. But it's really important to really to to understand the momentum of that place. Um, so every project actually started from zero almost. But there's some kind of, um, again, because um, nobody can escape from what he has learned before. So, so some very often there is some kind of, you know, coming back to certain references that, you know, um, I'm familiar with. And so over time, after curating somehow some 20 something brand news, um, um, I found that there are some uh, major questions remain central to all this project. The question of locality, the question of resistance, the question of um, increasingly um, kind of you know uh, defending uh, public sphere um, and also defending the right to difference and so on. And I, I think that become um, a kind of a recurrent position taking uh, in all those projects. So, um, so over time when you really look back for the two decades or something, um, I feel there, there are certain anchor points that well, um, uh, reflect maybe how the idea of contemporary art as a, as a, a public sphere um, um, is being globalized uh, in different conditions, but there's 
there's this interesting kind of um, interactions and, and tension among all these projects. So uh, I think that that's what I can say. There was another question. about the richness of some of the practices that I think are on the panel, which are quite different. Um, we've talked about exchange in terms of nation to nation, and then there was a suggestion of city to city, which I think is, is certainly something that's become more prevalent in, in Asia and the Pacific, particularly in East Asia, uh, in the last few years. Uh, I'm interested in the way and in the experiences that some of the panelists have had in which exchanges can actually deflect from uh, opportunities to to look within. So often exchanges are what's supported and particularly with some cultural institutions, it's really easy to get money for artists to exchange cross-culturally or cross whatever border and really difficult for them to get money to or support of whatever kind to look within and to do a project which is not cross-border, not cross-cultural, that's actually just us talking to ourselves. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering at, at how your practices uh, or your experiences, um, you know, might reflect on that problem. Because I, I know from a f for a fact that some of the projects that you that have been mentioned today might have been actually ways of using a so-called exchange process or cross-cultural process to enrich the local discourse and local self-reflection, that type of issue. I'm just wondering, I know there's not a lot of time, but is there a space to, to talk about that? I mean, yeah, it's more, it's more <laughs> difficult to... <laughs> you were talking? Well, maybe I, I can make a comment on... Um, uh, many years ago, I wrote something for a catalog in, uh, in, Guang, uh, in, in Busan. Uh, before the Busan Biennial was called the Biennial, was called the Contemporary Art Festival or something. So I was uh, co-curating that with Rosa Martinez and uh, Li Yong Chu. It was really um, interesting thing. So um, we called it, um, the, the show uh, The Islands. Uh, well, I forgot. Anyway, it w um, um, <laughs> so I wrote a paper that it's never um, been published but published in the catalog, it was published somewhere else. It's called um, um, The Transformation of Locality Through Bad News, basically, that's the idea. Um, um, the, the fact that, you know, the, um, the festival was not called Bad News, so th they didn't get the funding, as you said, to make the catalog. It was really interesting. Um, so we had the show done, and then, and then we didn't have the catalog. So, um, so this, in this paper, I was actually uh, trying to um, um, bring the question of what makes, again, you know, international values meaningful or make sense in a place. Um, basically, it's, a, it's not about pleasing the local people by um, being agreed with them, but it's about bringing a kind of difference to create a certain impact for them to, to disagree with themselves. And through this process, basically, we reinvent the place, we invent the community by creating debates. Um, I think that's the idea of all the, again, com com coming back to the question of bad news. Um, and so um, funding, uh, how much actually you can distinguish um, the funding, it's for transborder exchange or for kind of internal transformation. I, I guess, you know, um, it's very really difficult to, to um, uh, simply uh, separate both. So in a way, I, I don't know, uh, maybe it's not an answer to your question, but um, uh, it's, it's a reality it, that, you know, it, it's true that, you know, through diplomacy, you can get more easily some funding for projects. But um, on that side, you know, those projects are not 
at the end of the day, it's not about um, uh, changing the other. Also, maybe it's also about changing yourself um, by sending your artist to somewhere else and come back with this experiences of this debating with the other uh, or disagree with the other uh, and that you bring something back so I don't know um. so <coughs> for uh, this year Busan Dining Year uh, uh, has a theme of learning of, of garden yeah. uh, and uh, there is a, a learning uh, committee and they it's, it's not uh, any art related people uh, just a student from like 18, 17 year old student to uh, up about uh, 45, under 45, there are 20, 30 people. And they gathered uh, after the Biennale, they gathered together and then and then keep learning by themselves. So this kind of uh, sustainable kind of uh, situation brought by the Biennale is quite uh, fruitful in a way, I think. I guess, you know, at the end it's easier to, to apply for, for money for an artist dealing with, I don't know, the, the failed modernity in, in his country than for an artist that works, uh, uh, you know, about his own depression or something that, you know, it's more difficult to extrapolate in a, in a kind of like national logic of some sort. Are there any other questions? Um, if not, yeah, I'd like to thank my panelists and uh, thank all of you for your time in the afternoon.